all, and uh, a very special program that we have today. Um, you know, this is kind of a week where we're dedicated to diversity and the differences people celebrate. And one of the things we don't hear a lot about is the Native American culture. And as you know, I have some interest in that. Uh, one of you I know is uh, part Apache, I believe. Is someone in here? Anyway, uh, when I uh, explained the instruments that I play, the Native American instruments, uh, one of you had talked about that. But there is a wonderful, wonderful culture, the Native American culture, and uh, we're presenting a, a program today that has to do with what is called the Trail of Tears. And the Trail of Tears, we explain to you a little bit, but it's part of the Native American history and the way the Native Americans were treated when they, uh, uh, when the Anglos sort of took the place over. Um, Mrs. Delat, uh, who's going to be our presenter this morning, is a wonderful artist, musician, and dancer. And she will uh, take us through the Trail of Tears and explain a little bit about it from some first-hand uh, documents that she has collected. And it's a wonderful presentation. We did this at a gallery in San Juan Batista about a month or so ago, and it was very, very, very well received. So we hope you pay nice attention to this. It'll be a wonderful program. I'd like to present to Mrs. Delight. Today. I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, my name is Diane, and my great-grandmother was a Cherokee Indian. I didn't know much about my Cherokee relative when I was growing up. In fact, I knew nothing other than what my grandmother used to say, that there was so much sadness in her family, somebody ought to write a book. It was only later, after I discovered her unmarked grave, that I learned about her and about the journey that was made by her ancestors in 1838, a journey that is sometimes called the Trail of Tears. Today, with the help of friends, Father Martin and Stephen Purcell, we will tell you a story about that journey and about one of America's unsung heroes, a Cherokee woman named Huati Ross. As you listen to our story, I would like you to think about what a hero is and how you define the hero for yourself. As we all know, not every hero is a celebrity, and not every celebrity is a hero. Take my hero, Kwati Ross. We hear, hear about Sitting Bull, Geronimo, but who has heard of Kwati? In this room of my friends, very few people have. So we're going to change that, and as we do, let us try to imagine heroes who are not only strong and brave in battle or in business, but heroes who are strong with compassion and kindness, brave with loyalty and faithfulness to friends. So now that we are introduced in the Cherokee way, let us pretend that we are members of the same tribe and that we too are trying to get home to a place of peace and dignity, to a place of democracy and freedom. The Trail of Tears refers to the removal of the Cherokee Indians from their native home in 1838, and the journey of some 1,500 miles to Indian territory in the West, what is today the state of Oklahoma. It is believed that the discovery of gold in Cherokee country led to the forced journey, during which 4,500 Cherokee Indians lost their lives and were buried in shallow, unmarked graves far from their native home. As you know, the story of democracy is not new to us in this country. It is more than 200 years old. And as many of you are aware, there are tribes of people and entire nations that are just now beginning to pursue democracy and dream of a life with liberty. And their painful struggles make up much of our news. While we in America have come a long way on our journey, it is good to remember that nothing is easy that nothing great is ever achieved without mistakes. And to some extent, the Trail of Tears marks a difficult time in our own struggle to get to where we are. The journey taken by the Cherokee Indians was one of America's trials, one of her many tests. That is why we remember it now, because the treatment of our Native people in general is a reminder of the cost of America's journey to date, and a reminder 
that the journey to fulfill the promise of greater tolerance and respect for ourselves and our fellow man, that is democracy, never ends. We will always be tested, and we will always need heroes. Hear now the voice, the verse of tribes from the past, and imagine the road before us. <clears throat>
beautiful sun, only you remain. Beautiful moon, only you remain. Wonderful earth, only you shall live forever. White eagle. Mita kuye o yasen. Can you say it with me? Mita kuye o yasen. Mita kuye o yasen. Mita kuye o yasen. We are one family. So we will now turn to the journey itself as told by a U.S. soldier who assisted in the removal of the Cherokee Indians. His name was Lieutenant John G. Burnett, and in 1838 he was a young man who spoke the Cherokee language, and he assisted in the removal as an interpreter. In 1890, Lieutenant Burnett celebrates his 80th birthday on December the 11th. And at that time, he tells a story to his children and grandchildren about the removal. He tells them about the night of November 17th when the Cherokees encountered a blizzard. And he tells them about the wife of the Cherokee chief, John Ross. Her name was Kuwati. And on that night, she gave away her only blanket to a little girl who was suffering from pneumonia. And herself died before dawn the following morning. Sleet and snowstorm with freezing temperatures. 
And from that day until we reached the end of the journey on March 26, five months in journey, the sufferings of the Cherokee were awful. The trail of the exiles was a trail of death. They had to sleep in the wagons and on the ground without fire. I have known as many as 22 of them to die in one night of pneumonia or due to ill treatment, cold, and exposure. Among the number was the Christian wife of Chief John Ross. The noble-hearted woman died a martyr to childhood, giving her only blanket for the protection of a sick child. She rode thinly clad through a blinding sleet and snowstorm, developed pneumonia, and died in the still hours of a bleak winter night with her head resting on Lieutenant Craig's saddle blanket. concealed from the young people of today. School children of today do not know that we are living on lands that were taken from a helpless race at Bayonet Point to satisfy the white man's greed for gold. Future generations will read and condemn the act, and I do hope posterity will remember the private soldiers like myself and like the four Cherokees who were forced by General Scotts to shoot an Indian chief and his children. We had to execute the orders of our superiors. We had no choice in the matter. 25 years after the removal, it was my privilege to meet a large company of the Cherokees in the uniform of the Confederate Army under command of Colonel Thomas. They were encamped at Zolico. I went to see them. Most of them were just boys at the time of the removal, but they instantly recognized me as the soldier that was good to us. Being able to talk to them in their native language, I had an enjoyable day with them. And from them I learned that Chief John Ross was still ruler of the Cherokee Nation in 1868. And I wonder if he's still living. He was a noble-hearted fellow, and he suffered a lot for his race. At one time, he was arrested and thrown into a dirty jail in an effort to break his spirit. But he remained true to his people and led them in prayers when they started on their exile. And his Christian wife sacrificed her life for a little girl who had pneumonia. The Anglo-Saxon race should build a towering monument to perpetuate her noble act in giving her only blanket for comfort of a sick child. Incidentally, the child did recover, but Mrs. Ross is sleeping in an unmarked grave far from her native Smoky Mountain home. When General Scott's invaded the Indian country, some of the Cherokees fled to caves and dens in the mountains and were never captured, and they're there today. I've long intended to go there and trying to find them, but I've put off going from year to year, and now I'm too feeble to ride that far. The fleeting years have come and gone, and old age has overtaken me. I can truthfully say that neither my rifle nor my knife are stained with Cherokee blood. I can truthfully say that I did my best for them when they certainly did need a friend. 
25 years after the removal, I still live in the memory as the soldier who was good to them. However, murder is murder, whether committed by a villain skulking in the dark or by uniformed men stepping to the strains of martial music. Murder is murder, and somebody must answer. Somebody must explain the streams of blood that flowed in the Indian country in the summer of 1838. Somebody must explain the 4,000 silent graves that marked the trail of the Cherokees to their exile. I wish I could forget it all, but the picture of 645 wagons lumbering over the frozen ground where their cargo of suffering humanity still lingers in my memory. Let the historian of the future tell the sad story with its sight, its tears, and dying moans. Let the great judge of all the earth weigh our actions and reward us according to our work. Young people, this ends my promise. Birthday story is December 11th, 1890. Ya qua ti su consini a cono sta colonna Congratulations, and if you do not, and say nobody knows or appreciates the gifts that you have to give, then I ask that you remember today and know that 150 years plus may pass and someone just may remember you for acts of compassion, loyalty, bravery, friendship, kindness, just as we are today, remembering and responding to Lieutenant Burnett's request in 1890. A towering monument for Quanti Ross? Not exactly. But a thank you, yes. A thank you for the gift given to our imaginations. That the journeys to freedom and dignity taking place in our time are not only to be defined by the news of war and our inhumanity to our fellow man, but by the gift of a blanket and the countless acts of compassion that we, the people, can give. From Kwati Ross, a Native American hero of compassion, we remember that peace is not the property of the powerful. Like her, we can give a blanket, defend our humanity, and step forward in the direction of that freedom and dignity we must not fail to imagine. And we can, or at least some of us can, grow up to be heroes. Wada, Kwati, Wada. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> 